So what I'm talking about now is, is definitely going to be uh, very much connected with uh, what I talked about before. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about a lot of the same ideas and some of the same problems that we find in contemporary Lutheranism. Um, but I'm going to be honing in specifically on the doctrine of, of the mystical union. Uh, so I, I'm dealing here with the theology of C.F.W. Walther and the early Missouri Synod. Uh, and the reason why I'm getting that uh, particular is because I've, I've given, this is my third talk this year on the mystical union. Uh, I've spoken at other conferences on this subject. So I wanted to do something a little different. I don't want to just keep giving the same talk over and over again. Uh, so I wanted to focus in on, on a couple particular historical figures. And so I'm going to be looking at primarily the thought of C.F.W. Walther, uh, but I'll be looking a little bit at uh, Kretzmann as well, uh, of the Kretzmann commentary series that uh, many of you probably know, which are very familiar. Um, okay, so starting off, I want to talk about uh, the divisions of, of union. Okay, so there, there are different ways in which union can be spoken of, and I have three specific things listed here as we're talking about and defining what this idea of, of union with Christ is all about. Uh, first is the unio fidei formalis. Uh, this is the formal union of faith. And uh, this is a different kind of union than we're going to be talking about uh, when we're talking about the, the mystical union. And uh, the Unio Fidei Formalis is, uh, this is a legal union, okay? This union is connected not so much with sanctification, uh, but with justification. And uh, so this corresponds roughly with Luther's marriage metaphor. Uh, so what Dr. Lyons just spoke about on justification, when he talked about this idea of, of marriage, uh, that's this idea of the union of faith. And so there is this intimate union that Christ has with the believer. And through this union, we have the great exchange. And so this is what Luther talks about uh, as the great exchange. He talks about this in On the Freedom of a Christian uh, and in his Galatians commentary, uh, where we are married to Christ in faith, and through that union of faith, uh, we receive that which belongs to Christ. And so we receive his righteousness, we receive forgiveness, we receive all that is Christ's uh, in faith. Uh, David Hallaz, who we, we just heard uh, criticized in the last lecture, uh, he, uh, not in the last lecture, but in Eric, uh, Dr. Phillips' last lecture, uh, he is the one who first utilizes this terminology of the unio fidei formalis. Um, but really, I don't think he's, it's anything new. I think he's really just talking about what Luther uh, refers to as this marriage union uh, of faith, where Christ and the believer are united in faith. Uh, so it's really not new with, with, with uh, Halas, but it's, uh, it's just kind of formatted in a specific way. Uh, and we do find this uh, reiterated by later theologians. Uh, so Francis Pieper, for example, uh, he affirms this. He distinguishes between this and the, the mystical union. Uh, it's only in a footnote, so you're probably not going to find it in Pieper if you're just reading through it. Uh, but he does mention it. Uh, so Pieper affirms that he calls this an external union. Okay, so he says, this is an external union why, whereby in faith I am connected with the Christ who is outside of me. Okay, so it has to do with alien righteousness. Uh, so he calls it an external union. So that's one of the ways of, of speaking about it that we find in, in the Lutheran tradition. And we find this in uh, figures like uh, Revere Franklin Widener as well. Uh, we find it in Heinrich Schmid and some others uh, as well. So that, that is the unio fidei formalis. Um, or the formal union of faith. This is what Paul is talking about uh, when he, in, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 9, for example, uh, when he says that he is found in Christ, not having a righteousness of his own, but that which is through faith. Uh, and so he has not his own righteousness, but he has the righteousness of Christ imputed to him because he is in this union of faith. Uh, or in Romans 6, it's, it's talked about as a baptismal union. And so through baptism, I am united to Christ's death, and I am united to his uh, resurrection. So I receive all that is Christ. I receive his death and his resurrection uh, accounted to me as I am baptized into him. Uh, second, I have what is listed there is the objective historia salutis reality of union. Uh, and let me just explain the, the term there. Historia salutis is a, is a term that you're really going to find um, it more in Reformed theologians. Um, and this is something which is differentiated from the ordo salutis. Uh, and I think it's a helpful distinction. Uh, the historia salutis is salvation as it is worked out in history, 
whereas the Ordo Salutis is salvation as it is applied to me personally. So essentially, Historia Salutis is second article stuff, Ordo Salutis is third article. Um, that's really, really what we're saying there. Uh, and, and so I say there's a Historia Salutis reality of union, meaning that this is, this is uh, well, this is the incarnation. This is the hypostatic union, okay? So uh, there is a union that precedes my birth uh, because in the incarnation, Jesus united himself to human nature, and in doing so, Jesus united himself in some mystical sense, Jesus united himself to the entire human race. And so this is why we can talk about objective justification. And so we can say that when Christ was raised from the dead, all people were vindicated in him. Uh, and so, so the Reformed Church, for example, will deny that in the Incarnation, Christ took upon himself all human nature for, for the whole human race, uh, because that would then imply that his work was for all. So I think it's important to have this Historia Salutis reality of union behind what we're talking about. So this is just another way of basically saying we have the, you know, the objective justification before we have this subjective. So we have the work of Christ in history before we have what affects us personally or how the Holy Spirit brings salvation to us. And then we have the unio mystica, which is the, this is the topic uh, that we are talking about uh, right now uh, and today. This is what we're going to be focusing on. This is the indwelling of the triune God, which affects sanctification or growth in holiness. And so our next talk is on sanctification, and these are intimately uh, related topics. And so this is what you're going to find discussed, for example, in Article 3 of the Formula of Concord. Uh, when you have uh, Andreas Osiander, who is starting to teach uh, that we are justified or we are declared righteous not by the imputed righteousness of Christ, but by the indwelling of Christ, which changes us and sanctifies us. And in Article 3, the, the formulators of the formula of Concord, they, they don't reject that idea. They say, look, this is true. Osiander's right. Christ indwells us and he changes us, but that's not justification. Uh, and, and the specific language that they use, they say these two kinds of righteousness must be kept distinct. So there are two different kinds of righteousness. We'll be hearing about that talking about sanctification. And uh, so while there is this, this uh, union of faith, there is also this mystical union. And the mystical union is what we're going to be talking about uh, in relation to our talk today. And so we're not going to focus on this, this union of faith uh, because when you look at a, a Lutheran systematic theology textbook, uh, you're going to see the mystical union is, is the most commonly discussed aspect of this. And so this is what we're talking about in connection with, uh, with sanctification. Okay, so here's a definition of uh, the mystical union. This is from Revere Franklin Widener. You can see his beautiful beard, um, which shows forth the wisdom that he has, of course. <laughs> And uh, this is what he says. He says, the mystical union as the result of indwelling grace is the spiritual conjunction of the triune God with the justified man in whom as a temple hallowed to himself, God dwells by a special personal presence, not the presence of separated gifts, but of substance bringing the gifts and operating by a gracious influence in him. And so here he's talking about the definition of uh, the mystical union uh, having to do with the indwelling of God, okay? We're talking about the indwelling of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So this is, there's this intimate uh, union that we have with God himself. And, and the language he uses here specifically really comes from the formula of Concord itself. Uh, in the condemnations in Article 3 of the formula, uh, the, the authors of the formula reject th this idea that it is only the gifts of God that dwell in believers, it is God himself who dwells in believers, okay? So God is not apart from us just giving things to us, but he is within us himself. He dwells within us, and he is the one changing us. Uh, and then all of the spiritual graces that we receive apart from justification, and we're talking about our growth in the Christian life, all of that comes through the indwelling of God. So uh, as we talked about last time, uh, we're, we're going to see that this idea of the mystical union, it was very, very important in Lutheranism at one time, but at some point, uh, the mystical union kind of gets lost. Uh, it's not something that you hear about much. If you uh, read contemporary Lutheran theologians, uh, or you listen to contemporary Lutheran sermons, or if you listen to contemporary Lutheran podcasts, uh, or read articles, you're not really going to see much talk about this. 
And um, this really, I think, is, is one of the, the most important reasons why we need to bring back an Ordo Salutis is because this particular benefit of Christ is lost. This is the one that's lost more often than others that we've really, really missed the boat on. Okay, so we have um, existential Lutheranism, which we talked about last time. And in existential Lutheranism, you're not really going to hear about the mystical union. So when those theologians who are influenced by existentialist philosophers, whether it's uh, Heidegger uh, or, or others... Uh, they're going to downplay the mystical union. Sometimes they're going to say this isn't true at all. Other times they're just going to just not really talk about it because it doesn't really fit their system. They might say, yeah, this is true, but it's, it's not really going to fit with, with the way that they do uh, theology. You actually find this even before uh, you have existential Lutheranism uh, with, with ritual and the rise of liberal theology uh, because in liberal theology... Uh, they talk about Luther's language of union with Christ, and they say, really, the union that we have with God is a moral union. So we live like Jesus. We look like Jesus. There's no actual essence of God dwelling in us. And so you find that even before existentialism comes on the scene. But existentialism denies this as, as well. Uh, and, and here is why. Okay? There, there's a downplaying of traditional philosophy and traditional uh, philosophical categories. So persons are identified as subjects who are addressed by God's convicting word of law and freeing word of gospel. So here's where you have this idea of, of the Divine Speech Act, for example, where we are defined by how God addresses us, by God's word of address to us. We are not defined by our essence. We are not defined by uh, who we are as God created us. We are instead defined by how God speaks to us. And in this kind of way of speaking, uh, you don't really just have a place for the mystical union. How is the mystical union going to make sense if the way that God relates to us is only through speech? Because when we're talking about the mystical union, we're talking about traditional categories of substance or what a thing at its essence is. We're talking about the essence of God dwelling within man. We're talking about a union of essences, a union of substances. And if you don't have the category of substance or essence as a major part of your theology, then it just doesn't fit. So you don't really have a place to talk about it. Uh, even though, like I said, you might say it's true, but you don't really have a category for it, so it's, it's just ignored. Uh, so there's no place for a union of substances. And so a lot of this goes back to a rejection of traditional philosophy. And by rejecting traditional philosophy, you end up rejecting a teaching that is very clearly in scripture and a teaching that is very clearly part uh, of the Lutheran tradition. And you end up uh, interpreting scripture in some weird ways. So I've even heard people say, well, none of the texts that speak about the Holy Spirit indwelling us actually mean that the Holy Spirit indwells us. It's simply that he is among us in the church. There's no actual indwelling of God at all. Well, that's not really consistent with scriptural or um, historic Lutheran teaching. So I want to talk about uh, in contemporary Lutheranism today. So we're not talking just about the existentialists from the early 20th century. We're talking about uh, Lutheranism today. Well, this has been at the heart of some discussions in contemporary Lutheranism, uh, and that is surrounding the Finnish interpretation of Luther. And uh, there, there's a movement in Luther scholarship in Finland that began in the 1970s, uh, surrounding figures, a figure named uh, Tuomo Monerma, but there's many other people associated with this movement as well. And uh, this discussion began because there were some ecumenical dialogues with the Lutheran Church in Finland and the, the Orthodox Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church. And so they were looking for commonalities, and they were saying, well, the East talks about this idea of theosis. Do we have something like that in, in the Lutheran tradition? And what they end up doing is they, they find that in Luther's Galatians commentary, he has this language of Christ being present in faith, okay? Christ is present in faith. And they say, well, this is similar. There, there is this talk of this indwelling of God. God transforms us, makes us like himself. He gives us aspects that, uh, of his own being. He gives us incorruptibility, immortality, all of the things that belong to God himself. And they talk about this as a kind of a great exchange, so in the great exchange, it's not only that Christ gives us his righteousness, though that is central, Christ also gives us things that belong to the divine nature. As, as St. Peter says, we are partakers of the divine nature. Uh, and that includes God's immortality. So we, are, we, we have eternal life because Christ has given us his eternal existence. He's given us his eternal life. So all of this, this is an aspect of, of the great exchange. 
Now, there's been quite a bit of debate surrounding the Finnish interpretation of, of Luther. And uh, there are some problems with the Finnish interpretation of Luther because what ends up happening is they end up conflating the two kinds of righteousness. And so some of these authors aren't as careful as others, and what they end up doing is saying the righteousness of God's indwelling is the righteousness of justification. And so there does tend to be kind of a confusion of justification and sanctification in some of these writers. Some are a lot more careful uh, than others. Monarmont himself, I think, is a lot more careful. Uh, and so some end up basically uh, kind of going back to this idea of one kind of righteousness, which you had in the Roman tradition. So it really is not that different from maybe the medieval Roman Catholic tradition in some ways, because justification becomes a process. Uh, and then justification and theosis are kind of conflated into the same thing. But I think that, that the major point that is, that is found there in the work of people like Monerma and others is correct. And that is that there is this theme in Luther of God's indwelling, God changing us to be like himself. Uh, there is this great exchange or this communicatio idiomatum where, where God gives us that which is his and he takes upon our sin and, and our, our corruptibility. And that's part of what Christ does on the cross. And so he really is getting at a really, really important point. Now, I have some other, uh, some other sources mentioned there. And these are ones that are very critical of uh, the Finnish interpretation of Luther. Now, the first one I have listed there is The Genius of Luther's Theology by Robert Kolb and Charles Arendt. Uh, this is a, a, a recent book, an important book, and, a, and a, there's a lot of um, helpful uh, and usable information in that book, particularly dealing with things like the two kinds of righteousness and some other things. Uh, but there, there is a little section on there on theosis. And uh, they reject any language of theosis, uh, and, and the reason is because they, they say, well, Luther doesn't view humanity in the same sense as, uh, as a Platonist or an Aristotelian would view humanity. And so in traditional philosophical categories, you talk about God's es or man's essence and man's being. But they say, well, for Luther, it's all about man as he is addressed by God's word. And so basically, on this particular point in, in this book, uh, they are really buying into what is the uh, more the existentialist approach to the human person. And because they have an existential approach to the human person, they say, well, there can't be any kind of theosis language. And really, by theosis, they're really also rejecting what is the historic teaching of the mystical union. It just doesn't really fit into that theology. Uh, so I think they're missing a very important aspect of Luther's thought uh, in writing that book, and, and I think largely that is because they are committed to uh, this ontology that is more similar to the existentialists and uh, the radical Lutherans. Uh, another book, and this is the one I have a picture of here, this is a, a more major scholarly work. Uh, it's called Who Do I Say That You Are? by William Schumacher. And this, this is a Missouri Synod theologian. And uh, if you want to read a critique of the Finnish approach to Luther, this is the, the lengthiest and most in-depth critique that you're going to find. And uh, parts of his critique I, I would agree with, uh, but, but a lot of his critique depends on his view that Luther has an ontology or an idea of being that is centered on God's speech, not on essences or substances. So he rejects, again, traditional philosophical categories. He says Luther doesn't speak in that way. It's just about God's word. And so while he's trying to just reject um, some of the errors that you find in the Finnish approach, the confusion of justification and sanctification, uh, I think if you read this book, essentially there's just no place left for the mystical union either, okay? So I don't think it's, it's not just a rejection of uh, the problematic elements, but it's a rejection of the mystical union um, as a whole, basically. He just doesn't have a place for it. Okay, so part of this is this idea that Aristotle and Plato, or ancient Greek philosophy in general, are viewed as opponents to the Lutheran faith. And so Luther is viewed kind of as the... Uh, as the anti-Aristotle, okay? So Luther is very much opposed to traditional philosophy. And what ends up happening is Luther's Reformation is viewed largely as a philosophical one rather than just a theological one, and I think that's very problematic. And just historically, I think it's dubious. I don't think that's what Luther is really trying to do. I don't think Luther is trying to just uh, throw out the entire history of Christian philosophy with his Reformation. Now, I wanna go to our confessions. Uh, and I think part of the problem is that we're just looking at, uh, a lot of this surrounds Luther studies. Uh, and so if you're going to read people who reject uh, the mystical union or theosis, 
uh, or you're going to find people who defend it, like the Finnish, the, the Finnish theologians, they're all going to be arguing from Luther's thought. They're saying, well, what did Luther say? It's important to look at Luther, uh, but as Lutheran theologians, we are committed uh, to our Lutheran confessions. Uh, we don't, as a church, confess all of Luther's writings. We, as a church, confess what is taught in our confessions. And uh, so that's the most important thing we want to do. So I want to look at what our confessions say about Aristotle. Uh, and I want to ask the question, do our confessions, which we are bound to hold as Lutherans, as confessional Lutherans, do they teach what we find in modern Lutheranism? Do they say that, no, Aristotle is wrong, Plato is wrong, we're not talking about substances or essences, instead, reality is constituted by God's speech act. Is that what our confessions teach? Well, here's a quote from the uh, Solid Declaration of the Formula of Concord. A congregation of ordinary people ought to be spared the Latin words substantia and accidents and public sermons, for they are unknown to ordinary people. But learned people among themselves, or with others to whom these words are not unknown, may use such terms in discussing the subject, as Eusebius, Ambrose, and especially Augustine, and also still other eminent church teachers have done. For these terms were necessary to explain this doctrine in opposition to the heretics. The terms assume a division that has no middle ground, so everything that exists must either be a substantia, i.e. a self-existing essence, or an accident, i.e. an outward thing that does not exist by itself essentially, but is in another self-existent essence and can be distinguished from it. Cyril and Basil also use this distinction. And uh, so our confessions explicitly say Aristotelian metaphysics are correct. Our confessions say this, okay? Our confessions say, yes, Aristotle was right. Everything is a, has a, is a substance, has a substance, and uh, there are accidents. Everything that exists is either one or the other. And especially interesting, I think, is the fact that they defend this by looking at certain church fathers. And if you look at a lot of contemporary Lutherans, they're going to say, Augustine is bad. Luther is the anti-Augustine. Very bizarre because Luther really is so influenced by Augustine. Oh, and especially Chemnitz. I mean, Chemnitz is always signing Augustine as the authority in the early church. Just read any of Chemnitz's writings. And so they're actually affirming the philosophy that undergirded Augustine's theology. And that would include his theology of personhood and essence, because this article is an article dealing with uh, personhood. So they, they deal with this particularly uh, in terms of the what is the Flaccian controversy, uh, where Matthias Flaccius argues that the human essence is at, its, is, is at its core sin. And uh, they argue, no, that's not the case. The human essence or the human substance is, in fact, a good thing, not a bad thing. It is a good thing that God created. And sin is simply an accident, as in sin doesn't define what the human person, the human creature is, even though it has such a profound impact uh, on the human person. And uh, this is why a lot of contemporary Lutherans, when they miss this language, they end up saying things that make it sound essentially like Flaccius was right, as if the human person is essentially sin. That's what defines who you are, and that's why it's about God's recreative word, because God has to kill you and destroy your sin and then create you anew as a new creature through his word of gospel. Uh, so you end up with this, this same error. Okay, so now I want to uh, get into um, one particular figure, and we don't have a lot of time to look at him, but I want to just talk briefly about uh, C.F.W. Walther. And there are a lot of theologians I could look at to uh, talk about the mystical union because so many theologians in Lutheran history uh, talked about this issue. But I wanted to look at Walther uh, because when I think about uh, the Missouri Synod in particular, I see that most contemporary Missouri Synod theologians don't talk about the mystical union. And if you're going to talk about uh, Missouri Synod theology, I think it would be good to go back to C.F.W. Walther, the most foundational theologian, along with Pieper, of the Missouri Synod, the first president of, of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Uh, so he's a pretty influential figure in the development of uh, the Synodical Conference and uh, American Lutheranism in general. And uh, I think Walther is an interesting one to look at because he's a pastor. Because when Walther is talking about the mystical union, he doesn't write a systematic theological textbook. You know, that was Pieper who did that, who didn't include the mystical union there for some reason, uh, unfortunate reason. Uh, but Walther includes this in his sermons. He's got all sorts of sermons that deal with this issue. He's got sermons on this particular doctrine, and he mentions it in all, a lot of his sermons. 
And so for CFW Walther, this isn't just some kind of theoretical doctrine. This isn't just something that is uh, tied to, uh, you know, high philosophy or, or, you know, Aristotelian philosophical discussions. But he sees this is a teaching of Scripture, and it's a teaching of Scripture that's practical, and it's one that we, uh, as pastors especially, need to be teaching to our congregations. So uh, I'm going to look at some quotes from some of his sermons, and here are the, the three that I picked out, and there could be many more that we could look at. Uh, The first is, on the gracious God dwelling in the hearts of men. If you really want a summary of Walter's view of mystical union, that's the best one to go to. Uh, Then we have the restoration of the divine image through Christ. And the the third is the daily renewing of the Christian in the image of God. And so the the two themes that we're going to see here are um, the indwelling of God and the renewing of the Christian in the image of God. And this is going to overlap a lot with sanctification, Uh, Because when we're talking about mystical union, we're really talking about something that's very much intimately connected with with our sanctification. I know Henry Eister Jacobs says, uh, really, sanctification and mystical union should be discussed in the same article because we can't talk about one without the other. Uh, They are so intimately connected. Um, And and I think part of the reason why there's some fear in talking about sanctification today in contemporary Lutheranism is because we don't have this idea of the mystical union. And if you don't have the mystical union, when you look at sanctification, sanctification can't be anything but my personal response to justification. So it's about me and what I'm doing. But if we understand uh, that sanctification is the outgrowth of God's dwelling in me and changing me, then we're going to give the credit of sanctification all to God because he is the one who is at work within me, changing my will so that I cooperate with him and the act of sanctification. So here are some quotes. We'll just look at at a couple of these. Uh, This is what what Walther says. He says, It's not enough for God only to have his work take place in his people and to fill us with his gifts, with his light, his power, his comfort. He wants himself with his nature, okay, nature or essence or substance, to enter our hearts. It is not enough for God only to make people his priests, who come before him and serve him, but he also wants to make them his temples in which he serves them. It is not enough for God to someday receive his people into heaven where they shall look upon him who is enthroned in glory face to face, but he himself already here wants to make them into his heaven and establish his throne in them. That's really a beautiful, beautiful statement. It's a beautiful summary of this great truth of the Christian faith, that is the the mystical union. And there are some common themes we see here in this quote that we see throughout the Lutheran tradition in in this discussion. And one is this connection between um, God dwelling in us and the temple. And so Walther says, look, it's not only that we're priests. We're not only called to to be priests, to intercede. We are called to be temples. The temple of the Old Testament was a picture of what is happening within our hearts. Just as God's glory filled the temple, God's glory and his presence fills us. And that's something we find throughout all of the the old dogmaticians. If you look at their chapters or sections on mystical union, they'll all point that out. We are temples. Our hearts are temples. God wants to make his dwelling uh, in us. And note that it says he wants to make uh, them his temples in which he serves them. This isn't just us serving God, but this is God coming to serve us. This is something that God does for us. This is a blessing that we receive. This isn't just about our works, but this is about something that God wants to do in us and his power that's at work within us. And this is a way that God wants to serve us. This is a way that God wants to give us his gifts is to unite himself to us intimately in this way. Uh, And then he connects at the end here, he connects what happens now to our glorification, which we're going to be hearing about tomorrow from Dr. Phillips. And so this is essentially glorification begun in the present. This is what I have here in the second point. The mystical union is the beginning of the beatific vision. It is glorification begun in the present. So this is God's work that he is doing in heaven begun now. And we see, as we look at all of the benefits of the Ordo Salutis, all of it essentially, it's all eschatological, and it's all coming into the present. So, as I said about justification before, justification is our eschatological vindication, uh, received proleptically, received now in the present, and this is the experience of that. It is the experience of the beatific vision come even now breaking into our present age. And so we are beginning to experience that that beauty of of our glorification even now as God dwells uh, within us. 
And I have another quote here. So should God enter into the heart of a person, then first a great transformation of his nature take place. There's this ontological language in Walther. It is the nature, human nature is actually changed and transformed. He goes on to say, indeed, it is impossible in this life for a person to be completely free of his sins. So here we have the, the, the very important truth, Simul Yusuf at Bacotter. Uh, we are at the same time righteous and sinners. We will struggle with sin our whole life. But that's not the end of the story because he goes on to say, but should the Holy Ghost make it his dwelling, his heart must be utterly freed from its love of sins. So there's a distinction he's making here. He says, no, we have sin, okay? Uh, we're sinners in this life. Prior to our, our final glorification, uh, we, are, we are sinners. But he says, we don't love sin in that same way. We don't love sin. We hate the sin that dwells within us. So, you know, this is the, the Romans 7 experience. And so part of this mystical union within us is that God is, is expurging our love for sin. He's getting rid of that love for sins that we have, and we grow in our affections towards God, and we turn away from our affections towards those things which are sinful. Obviously, a totally incomplete process in this life, but that begins in us. That begins in us. And this comes from Augustine. He's using Augustine's language of, of love. Uh, and you see, Johann Gerhard specifically cites Augustine on these exact same issues, um, talking about this idea of, of our affection or our love. Okay, here's another sermon, the restoration of the divine image uh, through Christ. Uh, so I'll look at a couple of these quotes. He starts saying, God's son appeared in this world for no other reason but to restore God's work which was destroyed, to bring back what we have lost, in a word, to restore us in the divine image of which we were robbed. He says the very purpose of the incarnation itself is for us to be renewed in the image of God. Christ became a man that man might become like God. Sounds like Athanasius. And Walther makes these kinds of statements over and over and over again. So it's very, very important for Walther in his theology. It's very important in the Christian life that we are being renewed in the image of God. And this is all through God's indwelling and changing us. Again, here we have almost an exact echo of Athanasius. God's son became like us that we should again become like God. That's Athanasius. Uh, and then he says he assumed the likeness of a sinner to bring us back to the likeness of God. Uh, a very beautiful quote, just really, really uh, great summary of uh, what is called in the church fathers, theosis, what they would have called theosis is what Walter's teaching there. Um, and, and if you look at my book, Christification, you can look at, at some of, of that. Uh, and I distinguish between uh, the way that theosis is taught in the early fathers and the way that it developed in the Eastern Church. So when I say theosis, I don't have time to get into this right now. Uh, what I'm talking about is what Athanasius is talking about in Irenaeus and some of the early fathers. I'm not talking about what the Eastern Orthodox Church talks about today. It's a very, very different kind of thing. Okay, so let's now look at the final quotation. And this, this is an interesting one here. He says, Consequently, we dare not think that God's Son became a man only to fulfill the law for us by his holy life. He's not saying that's not important. That is central, of course. This is the active obedience of Christ. He did not suffer for our sins and die on the cross only to win for us the forgiveness of sins, to deliver us from the punishment we deserve, to reconcile us with God, and despite our sins, unlock heaven and salvation to us. Oh, here he is. This is a beautiful statement about justification. He's not saying this isn't important or it's not central because it is, but that's not all there is. And he goes on, this is how many see Christ. They therefore seek nothing in Christ but comfort for their restless conscience. That they should actually again become holy is of no concern to them at all. However, they are caught in a great and most dangerous error. And this obviously is tied into the doctrine of sanctification, but for Walther, it is an essential part of the Christian life that we are renewed in God's image. It's not just forensic, okay? It's not just that we are counted as perfectly righteous. It's not just that we are declared forgiven. Even though that's central, we still are actually renewed. We are renewed in the image of God. We are renewed in the divine image, as he is going to talk about. Okay, the next one is, uh, let's see, on the gracious God dwelling in the hearts of men. Um, okay, let's... There, there's some great quotes here as well. Uh, he says, first, exactly thus, Christ not only wants to forgive all men their sins, but also to free them from their sins. He not only wants to declare them righteous by grace, but he also wants to make them truly righteous. He came, not only came to comfort and soothe their hearts, but also to cleanse and sanctify them. 
So here we see the renewal of the image of God and justification. They're, they're both very, very important aspects of the Christian life. Uh, he goes on then, he came not only to reconcile them with God, but also to reunite them with God. Not only to make them acceptable to God, but to make them like God. In short, he came to restore the entire lost image of God in them. So as there's, there's this intimate uh, relationship, this intimate union, this intimate connection that we have with God that is part of the purpose of the incarnation itself. And it goes on again in the next quote, he who wants only forgiveness of sins from Christ, yet wants to cling to many sins, not wanting to be completely healed of sin by Christ, makes Christ a servant of sin. He does not believe in the true Christ at all. He has a false Christ and will perish with his self-made sin Christ. It's the harshest statement that we find in Walther about this. Uh, he, he's never shy with his words. This is why they call Walther the American Luther, because he's, uh, he could be just as blunt when he needed to be. Uh, but, but his point is, you have to desire to be free from sins. You have to desire to, be, to, to um, be in union with God. You can't just say, oh, I believe in Jesus for the forgiveness of my sins and I want to live in all the sin that I can and just claim forgiveness. That's not how this thing works. Uh, and then the final quote on this page, it must therefore be fulfilled to the very smallest letters, talking about the law, not only by Christ, but also by every individual person. Strange. You don't hear that from Lutherans very often. Just this, to bring man again to this ultimate completely perfect fulfillment of God's law is the final purpose of the whole redemption of Jesus Christ. He says the whole purpose of redemption is that we fulfill the law perfectly. This might seem kind of confusing because, you know, well, Walther, I mean, he's the guy who wrote Law and Gospel, right? He, he is very clear that we sin our whole life. We're not going to fulfill the law. That's the whole point is the law shows us our sin. Um, but he's talking eschatologically here. He's talking about our glorification, and what he's saying is that, that our whole life on this earth is pointing forward to something in the future. It is pointing forward to a day when we will be completely cleansed of our sins. When this union that we have with God in part now is going to, to be fulfilled. We are going to see the face of God and we actually are going to obey God's law totally freely, without restraint, without sin. Uh, and so he's saying that everything in life here is pointing ultimately toward our eschatological glory, our union with God in heaven, the beatific vision. And uh, again, this shows us that there, there is this eschatological focus in the Christian life that we find in Walther's writings. Okay, I have two more quotes uh, from the daily renewing of the Christian in the image of God. Um, and these are some things that we've already seen. God himself has assumed the likeness of sinful flesh in order to renew us again in the lost image of God. Essentially, Athanasius again, let him remember that he who does not want to be renewed in the image of God here on earth will not awaken to God's image beyond either. So you have to have the beginning of the renewal of the Imago Dei here, if you want it in the future. He's not saying here that I receive my eschatological vindication because of something I do. He's not saying my final salvation is based on me or something I do, but... God begins to work that in my life now, and he will complete it then. So if you are truly justified, God is renewing the image of God in you. Whether you feel it or experience it or not, you could look at your life, and your life could, could feel miserable, and you could feel like you're just a sinner, and you don't see the work of God. That doesn't mean it's not happening. God promises that it's happening in all the people who are justified. So if you trust in Christ, you are being renewed in the image of God, whether you see it or not. It's, it's an objective reality. And that is true of all those people who will receive uh, the beatific vision uh, in heaven. Okay, so essentially the summary is the mystical union and the renewal of God's image are essential aspects of Christian salvation, according to uh, C.F.W. Walther. And we just looked just at a few sermons. I mean, you can read any of Walther's sermons. You find this theme all over the place. Uh, it's a very, very prominent theme in his teaching. Uh, here is a quote from Kretzmann that I have, and it's a very long quote. Um, but the reason I want to look at Kretzmann is because he's another well-respected uh, theologian within the Missouri Synod tradition. And I want to show this isn't only Walther, okay? There's someone else, there, there are other people who talked about this too in the earlier Missouri Synod. And this is just a beautiful quote. It's very long, but I'm going to read the whole thing because it's, it's very powerful. Okay, he says, This idea is still developed further, that Christ may dwell through faith in your hearts. So only the gift, not only the gifts and virtues of Christ, but the exalted Christ personally lives in the heart of his believers. Galatians 2.20. There is the most intimate, the most happy communion between Christ and the Christians, begun in conversion, but in need of daily growth and strengthening, for it is through faith that Christ dwells in the heart 
And the loss of faith and the forgiveness of sins means the loss of Christ himself. If Christ does not live in us, grow in us day after day, his power will soon diminish and his picture fade away. But with Christ in the heart, there is steady progress. That you, firmly rooted and grounded in love, be fully able to comprehend with all the saints what the breadth and length and depth and the height is. Love is the proof and test of faith. If Christ lives in the heart by faith, then love toward God and love toward one's neighbor will follow as a matter of course. And with the growth of faith in the form of firm confidence, love will also take a firmer hold on the Christian. It will be said as solidly as a root takes hold of the ground from which it derives its strength and life. Thus the condition is obtained, which enables the believer fully to understand, to get a mental grasp of what is the breadth and length and height and depth. All the saints should have this understanding. All the believers should grow in Christian knowledge and in the connection in which the apostles here writes he undoubtedly has in mind the church with its immense dimensions this building extends over the entire world from north to south east to west uh, through all periods of time until the last day it includes the believers that are now sleeping in their graves and reaches to the heavens where its exalted ruler sits at the right hand of god the church embraces the fullness of the elect not only of israel but also of the gentile world a poor small crew in the sight of men but a mighty assembly before the omniscient eye of god and we could keep going with this quote, but this, I'll spare you the rest of it. Uh, but if you want to, uh, to, to look at that quote, I put it up on, on the blog, and it's really just a, a beautiful, beautiful statement and summary of what this teaching of the mystical union is, is all about. So I want to offer some final comments before we get to our questions here. And, and so I want to ask first, you know, what can we do about this? Because we've seen that this has been lost. This is something that we don't hear about much anymore. So what do we do about it? Is there a way that we can uh, recapture this teaching? Is there a way that we can talk about this teaching? Well, I think the, the, the heart of that is in terms of theology, if we're talking academic theologians, uh, we must recapture a historic Lutheran ontology or a historic uh, Christian ontology, meaning we have to speak in categories of substance and accidents, like Christian theology always has. This is the language of our creeds. This is, this is the language of the church, uh, and it always has been. And I think to get rid of it uh, leaves you without ways to explain some of these important teachings of Scripture. Uh, the mystical union should be preached, spoken about, and written about. And here is, is what often happens, is people will admit that it's true because they know it's in the Lutheran tradition, but they don't talk about it. And so they say, oh yeah, it's the mystical union, I believe that. When's the last time you heard a sermon? Well, let me just ask you, has anyone heard a sermon on the mystical union recently? Lisa raises her hand, okay, maybe from me. <laughs> and Trent has, okay, so some of you have. But it's not a very common topic. It's not a very common topic in preaching. And for Walther, it comes up quite a bit. And Luther brings this up in his sermons as well. And we see this in a lot of historic Lutheran uh, preaching and teaching. So we need to be preaching about it. We need to speak about it. We need to write about it. Uh, the, the third thing here, I said, keep justification central and preach the mystical union from the perfect assurance and union one has with Christ by faith. And so we need to keep justification central. Uh, we need to always keep it central because the most important thing uh, that we can remember as Christians is that we are perfectly holy and righteous in Christ, and we need to teach the mystical union in such a way that that is central. Uh, because when we lose that, we no longer sound like Lutherans, but we sound like pietists, or we sound like the Eastern Orthodox or something else. And so I think a lot of people are afraid of the mystical union uh, because you can kind of take this in some weird ways. You can see it as kind of this experiential thing apart from word and sacrament. Or you can say my position, my standing before God is based on how much God has changed me. And this is a fear that we have, and, and a right fear, because this has happened in church history. Uh, so when we are speaking about the mystical union, we have to be careful in how we, we talk about it and always talk about justification uh, at the center, even when we're talking about this. Okay, so I want to ask finally, why does this teaching help? Why is this important that we talk about it? Is this just a scholastic thing? Is it just an academic thing? Or is it important practically in the Christian life? I say, well, it helps to teach about it because many Lutherans confess its truth, but they don't know what to do about it. Uh, and if the more we teach on it, the more people are going to realize, hey, this is an important teaching of Scripture, and this is why it matters. This is why it matters. Okay, it helps us to understand and explain justification in a Christological manner. Uh, I, th I think I meant to write sanctification, actually. Uh, so, so what I meant to say is, is sanctification in a Christological manner, meaning that uh, my growth in holiness is not just my work. It's not like God does his part and I respond to God with my sanctification, but it's all about Christ as well. It's about Christ in me, Christ changing me. So justification is Christ for me. Sanctification is Christ in me. 
Both are Christological. Christ is at the center of both. Uh, and the mystical union helps us to explain sanctification in a way that we're keeping Christ at the center. Uh, and then finally, I said the mystical union is the outgrowth of the union of faith, and this helps to explain the connection between justification and sanctification. Uh, and so it helps us to kind of see some things in Scripture uh, where, uh, you know, Christ talks about how uh, we dwell in him and he dwells in us. Okay? We dwell in Christ, that is justification. He dwells in us, that is sanctification. That's union language as well. So it kind of helps us to explain uh, how these things relate. I am in Christ, Christ is in me. That's another way of talking about essentially the truths of, of uh, these two kinds of union or, or uh, justification and, and sanctification. And so that can be a very... Uh, very helpful thing. Well, that's the end of uh, my presentation here, and I think I actually, uh, I did it in exactly 45 minutes, so I actually have uh, time for questions. Thank you. Could you discuss a little bit of how a Lutheran sacramental theology plays into the mystical union? Yeah, that, that's hugely important, uh, because the mystical union is really all about the sacraments. And here, here's where we get, and it's, it seems strange, because uh, the Eastern Orthodox tradition is, is a very sacramental tradition, but when we're talking about union with God, um, they're not really talking sacramentally, but we are. It's one of the distinctions between us and some other traditions, uh, or some of the mis mystical Roman Catholic traditions, uh, is when they're talking about union with God, they're often talking about a personal experience that they have in prayer. So it can be a kind of this ecstatic experience. I am, you know, it's, it's the monastic kind of ideal. I am by myself. Uh, praying, staring at my navel, which did happen at times in the Eastern Orthodox tradition. Uh, and this, uh, that's, that's a real thing. That's the Hezekast. That's what they did. Um, but, but in a Lutheran understanding, uh, we don't want to be enthusiasts. That's what our confessions condemn. So we don't want to be people who look for God within us. It is true that God is within us. Um, but we find our assurance of where God is in word and sacrament. Um, so I, if, if I doubt, for example, if I'm doubting, is God really in me? You know, you look at that Walther quote where he says, nobody who is not renewed in the image of God today is going to receive his heavenly inheritance. What do we say about that? Well, how do I know I'm going to receive heaven? Do I look inward and see, is God changing me? Well, no, we look at the sacraments because that's where God has promised to unite with me. So we know that it's happening because God has given us the means to do it. And uh, so if you look at Chemnitz's uh, work on the Lord's Supper, or on the two natures of Christ, he's going to talk a lot about this union, uh, but he's going to talk about it in terms of the Lord's Supper, primarily. Uh, and Scripture uses union language with relation to baptism all the time. So it's very much a sacramental reality. I guess I would just quickly point out, Apology 20 is probably the first and strongest uh, accentuation on this point of the innate connection between the Eucharist and the mystical union. It's that, got that long quotation from Cyril. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's the whole, I mean, our, uh, Apology 20 is not terribly long because there wasn't that many disputes at the time about it. But um, I was wondering, I mean, I've heard, I've heard one way of uh, acknowledging and granting, oh yeah, reality of mystical union, that, strangely enough, almost sounds too sacramental, and this is what I mean. Hmm. You're in union with Christ, while you're taking the sacrament, you know, you know, it's this sort of like sacrament as pledge only, like it's really neat that it's the body and blood of Christ, but really what you want is the forgiveness of sins as though you can separate those things. So hurry past, this is the flesh of God and you have received it with your, with your bodily mouth. What a, mag what a, what a mystery this is, you know? And uh, I mean, you see this, the most extreme sort of ridiculous version of this is in the Roman church where they actually have it in canon law that it remains the body of Christ for 20 minutes and then I guess you've got all you need out of it. But we also have a way of sort of like, well, you know, you know, rush right past this is the body of Christ to for the forgiveness of sins. And you can't, you know, do that. Uh, but I guess my, my question is, uh, how do we pro appropriately speak of the mystical union as ongoing, nourished by the sacraments and the word, yeah. but still real, you know, when you're not, like when you get up from the altar and walk out the church door? Yeah, and, and that's, a good, that's a good question, because it's not like Christ unites himself to us with the supper and then he's gone. Yeah. Um, scripture is very clear that Christ dwells within our hearts. Um, and... In that one book that, that I mentioned, uh, that's the criticism of, of uh, the Finnish approach to Luther, uh, Schumacher at one point actually says uh, 
the supper isn't given for sanctification at all. It's just forgiveness. Totally misses the boat, and uh, our confessions do speak about sanctification. In the large catechism, Luther does. In the large catechism, Luther, Luther talks about uh, the growth in holiness, and he says uh, our growth in holiness comes from two things. He says the forgiveness of sins and the holy Christian church. And so since he connects the forgiveness of sins with that growth, anytime you're receiving the forgiveness of sins, you're also being renewed in the image of God. They're always connected for Luther. One that always causes the other. Uh, so if you have forgiveness, you automatically have renewal. Um, and, and I think that's something that, that maybe sometimes is lost. You can say it's just people think it's just one um, with, without the other. But I would urge somebody uh, to just go read Chemnitz on the Lord's Supper um, and just see where our tradition has, has come from because it's, it's extremely clear um, that the Lord's Supper has always been seen as something that, that sanctifies or, or uh, continually strengthens that union that we have, we have with Christ. Yes. So why is this practical? Why does this matter for lay people? Well, there's a lot of things, uh, a lot of ways in which I think, I think it's practical. Uh, it's practical because it gives us a lot of comfort. Uh, I mean, I, the, the idea that Christ is in us, not far away from us, is, is a beautiful teaching. Uh, I, I mean, I think that that's one of the most comforting truths. When somebody is going through a time where they feel sorrow, or they feel abandoned by friends, they feel abandoned by family, uh, you can tell them this truth in Scripture. Christ is in you. He is here with you. Yes, he's here with you in the sacraments, but he's even in your heart, dwelling in you, changing you to be like him. Uh, or if somebody is struggling with sin, feeling like I have no progress in the Christian faith, I'm not growing, I struggle with the same sins over and over again, you could point them to the promises of God in Scripture that God is renewing them in the image of God, whether they see it or not. That, that's the beautiful thing about it. We trust in the promises of God. We don't trust in our experience. Uh, so that should actually be strengthening and helpful for people who are struggling with sin. Uh, people see it as exactly the opposite. They think, oh, if you're struggling with sin, just tell somebody they're forgiven and God doesn't change them and it doesn't matter. Well, I think it's, it's very uh, empowering and helpful for people to hear God is forgiving you, but he is also changing you. It doesn't matter if you see it, he's working and he promises he's working. Uh, it also strengthens us in our, um, in our hope for heaven. It strengthens us in seeing the relationship between our life now and our life with God at the end, that God has begun that life now in us. So there's something very powerful about the Christian life that, that we are experiencing heaven itself. And that helps us to explain the worship service because heaven and earth become one in worship. This is something that's very unique about the Lutheran approach to, to worship as well. Uh, so it helps us to see our whole lives in a different perspective with this end goal of heaven having begun now. So it's not like uh, there is life now and then heaven is something totally different uh, to where it's so separated that we have a hard time connecting these two things. But no, it's begun now, even now. Um, so those are some, I mean, I, you could go on and on. Pastorally, I think there's so many ways that this is helpful, uh, but those are probably primary. Um, and ultimately, you know, all theology should be practical and pastoral, and if it's not, it's worthless theology. Continuing with that, um, if you don't have this idea of a mystical union now, God working in you the change that will be complete in the resurrection, mm -hmm. the change that will be complete at glorification, um, then, yeah, you really do lose the continuity between your struggle to obey and mm -hmm. to be good and to be holy and to please God and serve your neighbor right now and, and the state, the heavenly state. You, you have this completely bifurcated relationship instead where right now you're a poor, miserable sinner and every once in a while, totally by accident, you do something good when you're not even looking. Um, but uh, in heaven, you're going to be totally different. But this is actually, I mean, this, when, when you understand it in, in this context, then the, uh, the heavenly promise that you're going to be perfect, that you're going to... Uh, live with Christ in everlasting innocence, righteousness, righteousness, and blessedness. You can actually get that as the comfort for your struggles now. Mm, yeah, exactly. I, I seem to be really failing at this, but I'm guaranteed that I am actually going to succeed. <laughs> you know, not Absolutely. by my strength, but I will come through and I will win the victory. And um, I'm, I am going to get this, not by my own strength, but it's guaranteed. Yeah, thank you. That, that's very helpful, uh, pastorally. I mean, that's really Romans 7, right? That's the end of Romans 7. It's this cry for eschatological redemption from the body of death. 
Um, and I know some people will read that in a weird way to say there's total discontinuity. There's this stuff and this life doesn't matter and then it's all about uh, the future. And I think that's a very depressing way to look at life, to think, well, God's not changing me. God's not doing anything through me. I can't do anything good. If you couldn't do anything with your life, God would kill you the moment you're baptized and take you to heaven. He keeps you here for a reason. He wants you to serve your neighbor. He wants to conform you to his image. He has things for you to do. Yeah, this life is a good thing. We don't just, you know, uh, walk around with our heads down. Say, oh, I'm a miserable sinner. God's not doing anything for me. He's only going to do that when I die, and uh, I'm just going to weep and cry about my sin all the time. I mean, that's, that's, not, that's not the way that we're called to live our life. Um, and so I, I think an understanding of the mystical union does help us to, it helps us to have joy in this life. Uh, it helps us to understand our purpose. It helps us to understand just a lot of life's basic questions, I think, that people ask uh, just in the average congregation. We have time for one more question, I believe. Are you guys going to keep teaching us this stuff? Keep teaching? What do you mean? Yeah, in our pulpits. In our, in well, our I hope so. People? That's the goal, right? This should all be in our pulpits. Uh, that's the, the goal of all of this is, uh, is that this will be preached. It's taught to the congregation. Um, you, you mentioned uh, you know, a lot of people avoid speaking about um, you know, Christ being within mm -hmm. uh, a lot of Lutherans. And I think there's a... a, a weakness perhaps on, um, in American Lutheranism of um, reacting. We don't want to, we don't want to be a, a lumped in with a given group, so we got to really show we're not part of that. Uh, and so you see, well, we can't do this practice because it looks too Roman Catholic, or we, we can't use this kind of language because people might think it's the same thing as, you know, American evangelicalism. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think it's, it's a warning to us uh, that we, we can't just go to the other ditch because, well, there might be some confusion. You have to be ready to teach. Yeah, I, that, that's a very good observation. I think that that is a problem that we, that's probably people have in general, uh, but we see it in the Lutheran church is that we, we overreact to things. So we don't want to be something, so we kind of go to the other extreme. Uh, and theology throughout history does that. If you look at just any theological trends, people always bounce from this extreme to this extreme to this extreme, uh, whereas the truth is usually something of a balance. Uh, so, I mean, think about, you know, Calvinism and Arminianism. You know, you have a strong double predestinarianism from uh, Theodore Beza, and Arminius, as a student of him, says, I don't like that stuff. That, that's very harsh, and that's wrong. So he says, eh, it's all about free will, and he goes to the other extreme. Um, and so we see this in theology generally, but uh, in Lutheranism, I think that we do it all the time, uh, and I think this is one way we've done it. We say, well, those evangelicals are always talking about Christ in us, so it's not about Christ in us, it's Christ for us. Instead of saying, wait a minute, it's Christ for us and Christ in us, but they both have they're different things. We just can't confuse them. So what, this is what the, the formula does in Article 3. Um, no, these are two kinds of righteousness. They're both important, but they're different. That's Don't confuse them. Yeah, that is the, yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that's the whole, the whole article on, um, you know, response to, to Flaccius is exactly that. It's saying, wait a minute, people aren't inherently good and don't have free will on the one hand, but people aren't inherently sin either. <laughs> so it, the formula is very balanced in the way that it deals with these issues. Uh, or, or think about um, the statements about uh, the necessity of good works. Wait, it's not right to say good works are harmful to salvation. It's also not good to say good works are necessary for salvation, Let's just say good works are necessary and leave it at that. That's a very balanced approach. Uh, and so I think we, we would do well to just look at our confessions and the way that they handle these things because they do it very well.